Hello, welcome to another edition of the VOD Weekly News Recap. I am Gloria Tadigatunjai. Good evening. Now let's look at the Gambia across our borders and international headlines. Five former NIA officers sentenced to death for Jamis era murder. Taba Abajo unveils his manifesto for GFF presidency re-election campaign. Former Nigerian president in the Gambia for capacity building training of National Assembly members. Senegal's ambassador welcomes Gambia's ban on timber trade. The Minister of Health organizes a validation bill workshop at the Caraba Hotel. Ivory Coast calls on Mali to immediately release 49 soldiers. UN report says children continue to suffer the consequences of war. Zimbabwe girls resort to Kaldong for sanitary parts. Famous boxing belt donated to Nelson Mandela stolen. Iran plans to supply Russia with combat drones, U.S. warns. Panama president reduced foil prices following protests. Wildfire range as Europe battles heat wave. Biden visits Israel ahead of Turney, Saudi Arabia trip. Those were the headlines. Now let's look at the news in details. The High Court on Wednesday sentenced five former members of the intelligence service to death for the murder of a political activist during the rule of ex-dictator Yaya Jame. High Court Justice Kumba Sila Kamara pronounced the sentence against the former head of the National Intelligence Agency, Yankuba Baji, after finding him guilty of murdering Ibrahim Solo Sande an important figure in the opposition United Democratic Party in 2016. Baji was also convicted of bodily harm. The agency's former operation chief, Sheikh Omar Jeng, as well as NIA officer Bakari Sila, Lamin Dabo, and Tamba Mansari were also convicted on the same charges and sentenced to death by the Banjo court. Sanding was arrested during an April 2016 demonstration against Jamin. He died in custody two days later after having been beaten and tortured. His death galvanized a political movement that eventually upstirred Jamme, who had ruled the nation for 22 years. Lamin Kaba on Wednesday has unveiled his manifesto at the Oasis building, Senegambia, as he seeks for another mandate as the Gambia Football Federation president against his opponent businessman, Sadibu Kamaso, in August 2022, Gambia Football Federation elections. In his manifesto, Mr. Bayo came up with several points that he wishes to concentrate on if re-elected. Points not exhausted as improving infrastructure capacity building, coach administration, reveries and medics education. He further elaborated the need for safety and security training, technical and grassroots football development. Today, the Gambia is a respected football nation thanks to our vision, strategy planning, hard work of the executive and the general football family. The Scorpions male a national team. We promised four years ago that as part of our campaign, Ahead of 2018 Gambia Football Federation Elective Congress, we promise to ensure Scorpions for ever qualification to AFCON final by 2021, or at least 2023. I think we are all celebrating our, our unprecedented uh, participation in it, just in the 2021 AFCON final set in Cameroon earlier this year. The achievements, as I said, could not be overemphasized. We are, we are, we are willing to take much of your time with that. But another, another history has been broken recently. For the first time ever, Gambia was able to see herself in five categories of the Continental Football Awards. I think this is, I'm not sure whether maybe we are all thinking along the same line, but I think this is something that every Gambian should jump to and celebrate. No continent has that. Stuff we never we never had that. Uh, let me give you an example of that. The team of the year, team of the year, the coach of the year, the player of the of, of, of the of the of the year, the young player, and also interclub female. As the the shortlisting proceeded, 
now we have our coach who remains uh, in the competition. He unveiled further plans of introducing youth leagues for both the men and women in Division 1 and 2. Explaining his plans in details, Mr. Bayo said that in capacity building, he will continue to make it a core of his agenda in order to eliminate the huge gap between the number of footballers and trained personnel for proper and sustainable development of football throughout the Gambia, which he said that the GAM project will be conducted every year in collaboration with CFA and FIFA like training of coaches, administrators, referees, and medics shall be implemented. Throughout the UEFA support project, he said the administrators' education will implement the club development and licensing programs by training all club administrators on branding, marketing, as well as fan promotion and engagement. He promises to train 500 security personnel and stewards on football match safety and security procedures by working with the FIFA CAF safety department and the Gambia security agencies as he stated that it will enhance harmonization of match security organizations in line with the FIFA CAF regulation. During the event, Mr. Bayo also mentioned that he will continue to observe strict adherence to the FIFA approach constitution with the executive committee holding regular meetings and ensuring sound management of the strategic directions of the GFF and also that he will appoint competent people to all stipulators, subcommittees and judicial organs and meetings and the decision would be in line with the tenets of the GFF constitutions. Lamin Kaba is a retired army captain and served in many diplomatic and cabinet portfolios including the Minister of Youth and Sport 1997 to 1998. former Nigerian president in Gambia for capacity building training of National Assembly members. I said the so reports. The former president of Federation Republic of Nigeria, Goodluck Jonathan, arrived in the Gambia for capacity building training for National Assembly members. I arrived in Banjo for a capacity building workshop for the Gambian parliamentarians organized by Goodluck Jonathan Foundation. In collaboration with the ECOWAS parliament, in line with the efforts toward consolidating democracy in our sub-region. Mr. Jonathan wrote on Facebook. The Good Luck Jonathan Foundation, founded by the former president of Nigeria, 2010 to 2015, is an independent non-governmental organization established in 2015 for the advancement of peace, reconciliation, and prosperity on the African continent. I saw to self reporting for VOD. The Senegalese High Commissioner to the Gambia, Basir Sen, has commended government's recent decision to ban timber trade, saying the move is significant in the relations between the two countries, especially in the fight against the separatist MFDC rebels. I hail President Adam Abaro's decision on the MFDC and the ban on the timber trade. These are very important decisions and I want to extend my warmest gratitude to him for taking them, especially at these critical times. This is what we take the two countries forward, Ambassador Sen told Lateral TV. The diplomat also renewed calls for the Senegalese committee in the Gambia to continue embracing their Gambian brothers and sisters and avoid violating the country's laws. He said the Senegalese people residing in the country should always remember that they are living with great people who are welcoming and accommodative. I also appeal to the Gambian people to continue opening their hearts to accommodate other nationals living here, especially their Senegalese brothers and sisters. It is only when we are united that we can together confront our challenges, he said. He said it is gratifying for him that only 20 Senegalese nationals are currently in conflict with the law in the Gambia. He said President Macky Sall, has advised him to take the relationship between the two countries very seriously. My number one task should be fostering the already existing relationship between the two countries and since I came here, this has been my preoccupation, he said. Ambassador Sen said President Adam Abaro and the people of the Gambia have been very helpful to him.
On Thursday, the Ministry of Health organized a one-day workshop for the validation of the draft bill for the establishment of the College of Physicians and Surgeons of the Gambia at Caraba Beach Hotel. Professor Richard Adanu, at the beginning of his speech, said that the college shall operate as a body corporate and perpetual succession and a common seal and may sue and be sued in its name, as well as it may acquire and hold both movable and immovable properties and dispose of its properties and enter into contracts. He further reiterates that the college is aimed to offer, promote international recognized specialist education in medicine, surgery, and to promote continuous professional development in medicine and surgery related disciplines. We inherited dilapidated infrastructure, obsolete equipment or absent equipment, life-saving equipment in certain, in certain areas, inadequate manpower, and so on and so forth. And health being a priority for his government, he strategized together with all of us to deal with the problems of the health sector, looking at various aspects. One of them is infrastructural development. And we have started, you've seen all the infrastructural uh, development work that is going on, renovation of existing health facilities, upgrading, expansion, of the current facilities and building a lot more new facilities. Procurement of life-saving equipment. Government and partners have spent well over $500 million on life-saving equipment during the past two, three years. He went further to say that it is also to promote postgraduate medicine research and contribute to the formulation of policies on sound health and public health generation to ensure Gambia can solve her specialist manpower needs and that is more sustainable. Mr. Adamu says that the functions of this college is to organize and supervise specialist training and continuous professional development and conduct specialist examination in medicine, surgery, dentistry, and related disciplines. Minister of Health, Dr. Ahmadou Samate, who was in attendance of the event, reiterated that his ministry has spent over 500 million in renovating, upgrading, and expanding the current hospital and building a lot more facilities and, and buying life-saving equipment by saying that irrespective of whatever they have in the health sector or how beautiful the hospitals are, if the country have incompetent and unqualified doctors to do these service, then the country have not started anything yet. Mr. Samata said that he finds the establishment of the college important as the country seriously needs to build its capacity and that they are getting help from all partners and neighboring countries as well as from lots of expats. Now let's look at the news across our borders. Ivory Coast officials have called on Mali to immediately release 49 of its soldiers who were arrested Sunday at the International Airport in Bamako, refuting accusations that were mercenaries. The Ivory Coast government said the soldiers were registered in the workforce of the Ivorian Army and were in Mali as part of the UN peacekeeping mission. Earlier, Malian government spokesman Colonel Abdullahi Mega accused them of being illegally in the national territories of Mali in possessions of weapons and munitions of war without the mission ordered or authorized. He added the intentions of those arrested were clearly to break the security of Mali. The soldiers were working for the Sahelian Aviation Services, a private company contracted by the UN according to the statement from both governments. UN Deputy Spokesman Fahen said the contingent was not a formal part of the peacekeeping mission in Mali, but were deployed by troops contributing countries in support of their contingent. And that's a common practice in peacekeeping missions. Mali's government said it intends to put an end to the protection activities of the Sahelians.
children have continued to suffer in consequences of man-made conflicts in 2021 despite some progress the united nations said on tuesday almost 40 percent of all killing and maiming cases of children were caused by explosive remnants of war anti-personals land mines and improvised explosion devices according to the latest editions of the annual un report on children and armed conflicts special representatives of the secretary general for children and um, armed conflicts virginia gaba called for all parties to take responsibility and refrain from their use the un official said post-conflict reconstruction processes to prioritize sparing the weapons which contaminate land and structure those countries where there is active, very extreme armed groups operating, such as Boko Haram and the splinter groups, the West Africa ISIL, the emerging East Africa ISIL. Um, these groups that were not so organized in the past are more organized now, and they, without a doubt, target girls. They target the abduction of girls, and they target, basically, the rape and sexual violence as a as a produce of that. Stop the re-establishment of communities and continue to cause unacceptable and disproportionate harm to children for dozens of years after the end of the conflict. The Gambia expressed concern about countries where very extreme groups, such as Boko Haram and its Splinter group operation. He said these groups that were not so organized in the past are more organized now, and they without a doubt target girls. They target the adoption of girls and basically the rape and sexual violence are a product of that. The report details the impact that various forms of conflict had on children around the world in 2021, but does not include Ukraine. The danger range from cross-border conflicts and intercommunal violence also impact the protection of children, especially in the Lake Chad, Brazil and Central Sahel region. The report highlights amongst 24,000 verified grave violation against children an average of some 65 violations every day. Children in rural Zimbabwe are forced to use cow drugs for sanitary wares and inflation with feminine hygiene products. Sunshine Domingo, 19, wriggles in her wheelchair as she tries to remember the last time she used a sanitary pad. I last wore a pad before my mother died last year, she laments. Now I have to use anything I can find, cow donk, leaves, newspapers and clothes to stop the blood from leaking. I wish my mother was still alive to buy me pads and medication for my menstrual pains, she concludes. Constant is one of the 72% of girls located in the rural town of Dombashova, 30 kilometers north of the capital Hera, who do not have access to commercial sanitary wear, according to a study by FNV, Netherlands Development Organization in Zimbabwe. An equivalent of $2. Sanitary pads are beyond reach for most of the country's 3 million menstruating girls who live below the poverty dirham line. Constant, her epileptic sister, and three other girls rely completely on the assistance of their visual impartial grandmother to manage their menstrual hygiene during the time of the month. Sanitary pads are a luxury I can't afford for my girl, grandmother Viram shared, explaining how the cow dirt's process works. I take the dirk, mold it, and leave it to dry so that it easily absorbs the blood. The girls do not put the cow panties directly on the skin. I wrap them the many clothes over it to avoid itching when placed on the underwear. Then I show them how to close their private parts to block the bleeding. She concludes, the girls have heavy flows with circles that typically last six days. We prefer this method because cow panties soak up a lot of blood. Once soaked, we dispose of it privately by burying it in the ground. Our Sohan culture does not allow that men see such things. This family story mirrors that of millions of 
impoverished women across the southern African nation who have resorted to desperate methods to manage their period, according to the Ministry of Women and Youth Affairs. Women and Youth Affairs, 60% of girls miss school during menstruation due to the lack of access of sanitary products and clean sanitization facilities. Girls with disabilities usually drop out of school altogether, as was the case of Constant. Apart from missing school, health experts say these methods are bleeding grounds for pulmonial and several bacteria that can result in reproductive health infections. The girls complain of itching and burning sensation in the vagina. When examined at the hospital, we notice yeast infection and early signs of cervical cancer due to infection in the vaginal tract, shares Teresa child care worker under the Ministry of Public Service, Labour and Social Welfare. South African police have launched a manhunt for suspects who stole a boxing belt donated to Nelson Mandela by US champion Sugar Ray Leonard. The world champion belt, worth over €3,000 has been on display at the Nelson Mandela's House Museum in Soweto. Police spokesperson Carl De Macasso Cello told the BBC that a case of theft was opened with the police on 2nd July. It is alleged that the staff who reported for duty at the famous museum on Villa Kelsa Street, where an anti apartheid icon lived between 1946 to 1962, noticed that the locks had been tampered with the day before. On investigation, it was established that the belt had been taken. It is unclear at this stage if anything else was stolen. Mandela, who became South Africa's first democratically elected president in 1994, also spent 27 years in jail for fighting against apartheid, was a boxing fan. I did not enjoy the violence of boxing so much as the signs of it. It was intrigued by how one moved one's body to protect oneself, how one used a strategic boat to attack and retreat. The belt, it means a lot, especially to Mandela and us as a community and also from us as tourist guides because it's one of the gifts that Babu Mandela got from Sugar Ray Leonard uh, because Mandela was an amateur boxer during his youth. We were so surprised good now that the belt is missing and no one did tell us, especially as tourist guys, because when you do a sober to tour, we don't miss coming to Mandela House and also you're also telling them that Mandela was an amateur boxer and also especially when you've got guests from outside. How one paced oneself over a match, he wrote in his autobiography. According to Mandela's house, the belt was given to Mandela shortly after his release from prison by South Africa's white minority government in February 1990. In June of that year in New York, he met U.S. boxer who had helped in the anti apartheid struggle, including Sugar Ray Leonard, seen below to Mandela's right. Now let's look at the international news. Iran plans to supply Russia with potentially hundreds of drones for its war in Ukraine, some with combat capacity, a U.S. official had said. White House National Security Advisor Jerk Sovela said the information the U.S. had suggested Iran was preparing to train Russian force to use the drone. He added that it was unclear whether Iran had delivered them yet. Iran said technologically, cooperation with Russia presides the war without confirming or denying the U.S. claim. There has been no special development in the relations recently. Iran Foreign Minister spokesman Nathal Kanili was quoted as saying by Iran news agency. Drones have played an integral part in the war for both Ukraine and Russia. Just last week, Ukraine appealed for donation of thousands of drones to aid its war effort. Both sides are using them to spot the enemy's position and then help direct and correct their own artillery fire on a target. The Kremlin has said Russian President Vladimir Putin will travel to Iran's capital, Qimran, on 19 July. He is expected to meet Iranian President Ibrahim Rehti and Turkish Recep Tayyip for peace talks on Syria.
Panama's President Lolentino Cortizo has announced a reduction in fuel price. The cost of fuel for private vehicles will be lower to $3.95 per gallon from Friday, a 24% drop from the price at the end of June. The announcement came after the eight consecutive days of protest. Demonstrators said that they want the government to do more to curb inflammation after the cost of food medicines and electricity as well as fuel fuel. In a televised statement, President Cortizo said the price rises were due to the effects of the COVID pandemic and the consequences of the conflict in Ukraine. He added that as well as reducing petrol price for private vehicles, his cabinet would cap the price of 10 basic products without specializing which ones. The cost of fuel for public transport has already been capped at the start of June at $3.95 per gallon. Panamanian media has described the measures as an attempt by Mr. Cortizo to retake control, the worst crisis since he came into office three years ago. The protests coincide with a week-long absence of the president who has traveled to the United States for medical tests. A heat wave spreading across Europe is boiling wildfire in Portugal, France, and Spain. Around 3,500 firefighters in Portugal are battling dozens of blazes as temperatures break record in various parts of the country. The worst has been reported in Leireia, where 600 people were forced out of their homes. It has triggered memories of deadly wildfire in 2017, which claimed the lives of more than 100 people. Heat waves have become more frequent, more intense, and long lasting because of climate change. The world has already warmed by about 1.1 Celsius since the industrial era began. Adelino, a 77 year old farmer in Leirede, said that everything burned. It looked like the end of the world, he said. The body of one person was found in the burned area in the northern region of Avelio, officials said. Portuguese Prime Minister Antonio Costa said the hottest temperatures are expected on Thursday. In France, about 1,000 firefighters are trying to control two major wildfires. The blaze in the northwest of the country have already burned almost 4,000 hectares. Most of Spain was put on high alert on Wednesday, and the country's state meteorological agency at Mel said some regions were suffocating. The Andalusian town of Almonte recorded a temperature of 45.6 Celsius on Wednesday. Spain's hottest day of the year is expected on Thursday. More than 70,300 hectares were burned in Spain between 1st January to 3rd July, the government said. Almost double the average of the past 10 years. More than 3,000 people have been evacuated to Turkey due to the wildfire in the southwestern Dakar Peninsula. Europe has been battling soaking temperatures all week. In the UK, the heat wave is forecast to peak on Tuesday with highs of 36 Celsius, 96.8 Fahrenheit forecast. U.S. President Joe Biden is visiting Israel at the start of the landmark regional tour, which will include a controversial trip to Saudi Arabia. It is his first journey to the Middle East since taking office. Mr. Biden will also meet the Palestinian president as well as Israel's and Saudi leaders. Palestinians have expressed frustration that the U.S. has not done more for them since his presidency began in 2021. But the main focus will be on his Sudan trip due to the tension over human rights. Mr. Biden has faced criticism over his planned meeting on Saturday with the kingdom's de facto leader. Israel, our brother Joseph. Baruch Habali Israel, Achinu Yosef. The people of Israel welcome you to the Holy Land with open arms and joyous hearts as Joseph, son of Jacob, who sought out his brothers. Here, Mr. President, you are truly amongst family. Like the biblical Joseph, you are both a visionary and a leader committed to advancing the United States of America, the Middle East, the world at large, and the state of Israel. 
This historic visit reflects the deep partnership our nations share, a partnership rooted in our shared commitment to democracy, justice and freedom, tolerance, security and peace. Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who was accused by U.S. intelligence agencies of approving the murder of Saudi defending journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Mr. Prime Minister Lapid, it's an honor to once again stand with, uh, with friends and visit the independent Jewish state of Israel. President Nixon was the first American president to visit Israel in 1974. I was actually, my first visit was, as you mentioned, as a young United States senator from Delaware in 1973, just a few weeks before the Yom Kippur War. I had the privilege of spending time with Prime Minister Golda Meir. I'll never forget, I was sitting next to a gentleman on my right when there were AIDS. His name was Rabin. I think, look back on it all now, and I realize that I had the great honor of living part of the great history of this country. And I did say, and I say again, you need not be a Jew to be a Zionist. The fact is that since then, I've known every single prime minister, and it's been an honor. Form strong working relations with each of them. In Turkey in 2018, the prince denied the allegation and Saudi prosecutors blamed Saudi agencies. When he was campaigning for the presidency in 2019, Mr. Biden vowed to make Saudi Arabia the prayer that they are for killing Khashoggi, who lived in the U.S. and wrote a column for the Washington Post. That's all we have for you today. Until we come your way again, I am Glorious Hadija Tunjai on the VOD Weekly News Recap. Have a good evening and thanks for watching.